Good afternoon. I'm Mandy Cohen, the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services for North Carolina. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. With me today are Director Mike Sprayberry, also Todd Ishii, the Commissioner of Prisons, and Tim Moose, the Chief Deputy Secretary of Adult Correction and Juvenile Justice. Karen Mangoon and Nicole Fox are our American Sign Language interpreters, and as always, working behind the scenes are our Spanish language interpreters, Jackie and Jasmine Metevier. Our, I'll start today, as usual, with a rundown of our numbers. As of this morning, there were 7,220 laboratory-confirmed cases in 93 counties. We have 434 people who are currently hospitalized, and sadly, there have now been 242 deaths. Last week, the governor outlined a path forward for eventually easing certain COVID-19 restrictions while still protecting North Carolinians. It is conditioned on widespread testing, aggressive contact tracing, and of course, data-informed policy decisions. These are our best tools to keep our communities safe and to protect our frontline workers. The path forward also continues to be informed by our private and public sector leaders from across the state. This week, we brought together stakeholders focused on informing how the state could ease restrictions and continue to protect North Carolinians. Two of these groups met today. The first group focused on large gatherings. It's chaired by Donna Julian of the Charlotte Hornets and included representatives from Live Nation, the faith community, and the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources, amongst others. The second group focused on businesses and is chaired by Gary Salamito of the NC Chamber of Commerce and includes representatives such as the North Carolina Retail Merchants Association, Biltmore Estates, Carolina Cat, and others. We have a separate effort as well collaborating with our restaurants. All of these groups are discussing mitigation strategies, such as optimizing social distancing of employees and consumers and congregants, screening of employees for symptoms, and combating misinformation about the virus, while also taking into account the realities faced by different venues and different businesses. Many businesses have already stepped up to enact many of these measures, and we're learning from them. We appreciate these critical partners, appreciate all of their input. They're going to help us navigate through this very uncertain time. I look forward to sharing more ways in what easing restrictions in the state could look like in the coming days. I also want to end by just addressing some confusion that we saw uh, circulating this morning about death certificates. Some local health departments are not the point of contact for death certificates. Death certificates are attained at the local level from the county register of deeds. The other entity that can provide copies of death certificates in North Carolina is the state um, State Vital Records Office. So not the local health departments, they're obtained by Register of Deeds or the State Vital Records Office. As you can imagine, we get a lot of questions um, and a lot of data requests. We want to always be giving you accurate information. We know that this is a challenging time and we certainly appreciate everyone's patience as we work hard to both respond to the crisis and respond to the request for more information. And we'll keep working hard for you every single day. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Director Sprayberry to give us an update. Thank you, Madam Secretary, and thank you for your leadership. Good afternoon. This is day 44 of the State Emergency Operations Center's activation for the COVID-19 response. One of our top priorities is to continue sourcing and obtaining personal protective equipment. Our purchase orders for supplies and equipment reached $280 million as of last night, but we've only received a little over a 5% of what's been ordered. We've also received items of PPE from the Strategic National Stockpile, as well as from strong private sector partners who have provided donations. It's important to note that many vendors do not actually have stock immediately available. For instance, while we've ordered over 21 million N95 masks from a variety of vendors, 
we've only received about 94,000 from those vendors, most of which have already been distributed. We're also working daily to streamline the processes for purchasing. We've been receiving countless offers from vendors via email, text, and phone calls. So, to improve our efficiency, we've developed an online form that vendors can use to review specifications for the items that we need and to provide their certifications. This is how the process works. Industry representatives can visit the state's COVID-19 website at nc.gov slash COVID-19 and click on the link that says NC is buying critical supplies. Once you register with the website, we have a team of purchasing experts who vet those offers. To date, the CERT purchasing team, that's the State Emergency Response Team purchasing team, has vetted 598 vendors with 305 still in the queue to be reviewed. Vendors who have been debarred by the state in the past and those who demand payment up front are dropped from consideration. We collect vendor and manufacturer information and more detail at that time in terms of what PPE is available from those vendors and quantities and potential ship dates. Vendors offering a product that we need and that meets specifications may get a call from members of our sourcing team. The sourcing team is also working with vendors who have been reliable in the past. Right now, the items in greatest need are gowns, N95 masks, and surgical masks. We're still purchasing other items in smaller quantities where our needs are not as critical. Currently, the CERT purchasing team is also identifying opportunities for longer-term contracts for PPE so we can ensure regular deliveries as we move forward. We've also had some questions about the actual need for PPE. Yesterday was one of the highest days of requests for PPE we've had to date with 76 individual requests coming in from hospitals, individual medical providers, EMS, long-term care facilities, behavioral health group homes, and other health care entities. While we're hearing from some hospitals that they currently have enough stock on hand, we know that many of our health care entities remain in great need of personal protective equipment. It's also important to note that these requests don't include the requests from local law enforcement and the fire service. We've received 161 requests from those entities yesterday. We still have 246 open resource requests from those local partners. We work to receive these requests as quickly as possible, working with the requester to fill their critical needs for the next seven days. The CERT logistics team made 34 shipments yesterday and 66 shipment Monday of resources to our county and hospital partners. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 response, We've had 6,399 resource requests, primarily for PPE. This far exceeds what we had during Hurricane Florence. We've been able to complete 3,833 of these requests. Others are in the process of being worked and filled to provide the necessary support. I'm proud of the CERT logistics team who is working around the clock to review offers, actively work with vendors to estimate shipping dates, and then manage the receiving, quality control, logging, turnaround, and redistribution of the materials to requesters. Moving on, today, soldiers and airmen from the North Carolina National Guard begin their important mission to support the state's food banks, area agencies for aging, and school nutrition programs. Nearly 300 men and women from the National Guard, along with more than 100 trucks, will begin helping the state's major food banks run their warehouses and make deliveries to the places that need food. We appreciate, appreciate their outstanding service. And speaking of food banks, please continue your generosity in supporting our state's food banks as they provide for the growing number of people who need groceries. Visit feedingthecarolinas.org to find a food bank near you. You can also make a financial contribution or a donation of shelf-stable foods. Thank you for following the stay-at-home and social distancing guidelines. Your actions are flattening the curve and keeping this event manageable 
for our medical system. That's so important. In closing, don't forget to look out for your friends and neighbors and call your loved ones daily. I guarantee you they'll appreciate it. And with your help, we'll get through this together as one team, one mission, and one family. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you, Director. And now, Commissioner, am I calling on you first? Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner of Prisons, Todd Ishii. Thank you, Secretary. The first offender in our state prison system has died as a result of existing conditions complicated by COVID-19. This is a sad day as all human life is precious. The health and safety of our staff and the men and women in our custody is of the utmost importance to us. This offender had been housed at Pender Correctional Institution in Pender County. The offender was a male in his late 50s and had underlying health conditions. Given his family's right to privacy and the confidentiality of prison offender records, we cannot further identify this individual. We are continuing to do everything in our power to stop this virus from spreading further in our facilities. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Chief Moose, are you going to address folks or just answer questions? Okay, terrific. So with that, we will turn over um, to your questions. Um, if you uh, can identify yourself and your news outlet when you do so, that would be great. Our reporter is on the line. Please press 1 if you'd like to ask a question. Our first question will be from Colleen Quigley with CBS 17. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Dr. Cohen. My question is about the food processing plants in our state. We know that there have been outbreaks at several of them. And I was curious, I know you guys have provided guidelines for these plants, but if you would consider mandating those similar to the executive orders issued for nursing homes. Colleen, thanks for that question. I think we need to distinguish when we are seeing an outbreak in a nursing home where our, our um, our patients and our loved ones are not leaving those facilities as opposed to what is happening at some of our, our plants. We also, we know that there's virus circulating in our community. So I don't think that necessarily this virus, it could be transmitted at the plant, but also it could be just transmitted in our local communities. What we want to be sure is that when folks are going to work, um, that, that our businesses are doing everything they can um, to enact social distancing and to prevent viral spread. Um, we've been working very closely with not only the owners of the, of the plants, with our Department of Agriculture that regulates this industry, um, and our local public health team and state public health team. It's really been a collaborative effort. We want to provide guidance from the public health department. And what I would say is that many of these companies are national companies and have learned a lot of lessons from other places in the state, and they have brought best practices here to North Carolina. I've been very pleased with the actions that they're taking to protect their workers, um, make sure that those plants can continue to run. They're so vital to providing for our food supply, not just here in North Carolina, but beyond. Um, so that work is, is ongoing and will continue to work in a collaborative process. But it is very distinct from what is happening in our nursing homes, um, where our patients are not only uh, not able to leave, but are incredibly medically frail. I think it's just very different circumstances and requires different kinds of guidance. But thanks for the question. Our next question is from Nikki Hauser with WITN TV. Yes, hi. Um, I have a question for the secretary. Uh, Mandy, I talked to some tanning salons um, and other non essential business who I know they've gotten approval to operate from the Department of Revenue. I just wanted to ask how long. Have these special permits for non-essential businesses? How long have they been given out? And why not just tell other non-essential businesses that they could operate if they kind of do the same things like social distancing and sanitizing? Why is, why is there a need to apply and do this on a case-by-case -case basis? Thanks for that question, Nikki. It's my understanding that there is no permitting process for distinguishing between essential and non-essential. So there's no process or application 
businesses can follow the guidance that was in that executive order to identify themselves as essential or not and to follow those accordingly so there isn't an application process. What we're asking for is that businesses who deem themselves essential to follow the social distancing guidelines and the protections we put in place. We know businesses need to operate during this time, um, but we want to make sure that we're preventing viral spread. And what we can see from our numbers is North Carolina has been doing a very good job. Um, I want to I want to really thank everyone for abiding by the the rules of staying at home and for those that do need to go out to work at essential businesses to really try to slow the spread of the virus. Um, I think that we are looking at our numbers. We see things that, uh, like the doubling time of, of where we are being extended, which is good. We see a leveling out of, of some of our numbers. That is also positive. So I think all good things uh, that, that folks are doing to work hard. I don't yet see a decrease in our, our viral spread, which is where we want to head towards. Um, but, but like I said, I think businesses are already working to implement some of these best practices, especially those who are essential businesses um, that need to run during this time. So we appreciate everyone's hard work. And we'd ask everyone to use good judgment, whether you are uh, someone who is just going out to the grocery store um, and making sure you're, you're staying socially distant and doing the appropriate hand washing or you work at one of those essential businesses as well. So keep up um, um, the good work and following the guidance in the executive order. Next question. Our next question is from Liz Schlemmer with North Carolina Public Radio. Hi, Secretary, thank you for this time. Um, we're starting to hear a call from some local governments who are asking either for the authority to uh, lift restrictions in their own counties or, or asking for a regional approach to lifting restrictions. We know that federal criteria for easing restrictions includes a downward trend in new cases. So what do we know generally about the current trends in new cases in urban versus rural areas? And would it maybe be possible to take a regional approach to lifting some of the stay-at-home orders? Thanks for that question, Liz. And those are the questions we're asking ourselves as well and wanting to look at the data. What I would say is that at the county level, county by county, um, that really feels very challenging to do um, in terms of, of viral spread. We know that people work in one county and live in another. We were looking at some commuting data from the Mecklenburg County, for example. The folks that that work in Mecklenburg County live in 32 surrounding counties. So trying to think about a county by county approach is really challenging. Um, but I do think a regional approach could be possible, but it has to be driven by that data informed policy. Those are the kinds of things that we're trying to look at now. Um, right now, what I would say is North Carolina needs to pull together as a state. Um, we know that we have urban centers uh, throughout our state in terms of where our geography is, which is different than some states who might just have one urban center and the rest rural. We sort of have, have a, a different geography. So we're just going to have to see how the, the data and the trends evolve. That's why we laid out that framework around the needing the testing capacity, needing the tracing ability, and then looking at our trends to help us make decisions. I think making decisions at the county level is incredibly challenging given how people move throughout the counties. The virus certainly does not respect county borders. I think it's reasonable to look at, at regions, but we have to be guided by the data to do that, and we're going to continue um, our work here. At the moment, we, we want to be making statewide decisions, um, and we have done so thus far. So really, again, and I'm, I'm so thankful I come back to that because I know this is hard, um, that we've altered everyone's lives. We've impacted business and the economy um, to protect public health, and I'm so grateful um, for everyone um, abiding by those things. Thanks, Liz. Our next question is from Gary Robertson with the Associated Press. Hey, this is uh, Gary Robertson with AP. Uh, this is for the uh, prison commissioner. Um, I wanted to talk about the news correctional institution. I see that there are over 440 positive cases there now. Two part question: One, are the over are the what percent um, of the inmates are now considered asymptomatic? There, I know it was really high to begin with. And then the second part: I noticed that the state health plan announced today that correctional officers statewide will now be tested. Are there any? 
plans to test prisoners at a more wide scale level as we saw at Noose. Thank you. Sure. I, uh, with regard to the first part of your question at, at Noose Correctional, I'm happy to report that out of the positives, we're continuing to see about 98% of the, the positives are asymptomatic. So less than 2% of the men who are positive at Noose are showing symptoms. Uh, we're really excited about the, about the opportunity for our staff to, to be tested. That is something that is, is on the minds and hearts of our staff. So uh, we're, we're very happy about that opportunity as it continues to develop. Uh, and as for, as for mass testing for our uh, offender populations elsewhere, we are monitoring that every day. Uh, we are in consultation with Department of Health and Human Services and our, our CDC guidelines every day. So we're, we're going to kind of approach that as an individualized decision guided by our, our team of health care experts. At this time, uh, our incident command team is not recommending any further mass testing. However, we are doing testing on a daily basis for offenders that are exempt, you know, exhibiting some, some type of symptom that could be related to the COVID-19 virus. Great, thanks. Next question. Our next question is from Taft Weyerbach at the Greensboro News and Record. Yes, this uh, question is for Secretary Cohen. Um, in the last couple of days, uh, Gifford County has gone from zero nursing homes with an ongoing outbreak of COVID-19 to two on the DHHS dashboard. Why does DHHS not identify uh, these facilities by name, location, and their individual case count rather than force the general public and the media into a game of hide and seek? Thank you for your answer in advance. So much, and we've we've gotten this question a lot, and I I I appreciate that um, folks want um, as much detailed information that we can can give. We are always trying to strike a balance between protecting patient privacy and sharing information in order to protect public health. Um, where we, as as well as many other states, have struck that balance is to provide the county in which those um, outbreaks or that those nursing homes are located. Um, a, as you know, for any nursing home, the patients, as we were saying in another question, aren't coming in and out. It's really those workers who who are at at the facility. But again, they don't necessarily live in that county um, or or even in the close proximity to that um, to that location. Um, so we felt like giving the information about the county allows us to be sharing information from a public health perspective while also balancing the patient privacy uh, side without releasing the name of an individual nursing home which can be small and have very few number of, of patients in it. Um, and as far as the case counts, it is one of those things that it is a rapidly evolving change in terms of the number of cases that are there um, as well as we're, we're trying to keep the folks who are at the nursing home focused on the infection control, and we know that it is a lot of work to, to make sure that they are focused on those outbreaks. It is a lot of work, um, and so we haven't been able to, to keep good daily counts. And so, again, it's that tension of wanting to provide you accurate and, and timely information um, in a way while folks are also responding to the crisis. So we're going to continue to try to improve that, but that, that balance between privacy and uh, sharing information information for public health. Um, that's why we give out the county information, not the specific name of the nursing home. Thank you. Our next question is from Ames Alexander at the Charlotte Observer. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, uh, question for uh, uh, the secretary, and this is kind of a follow-up to a question asked earlier, but from state DPS data, it looks like fewer than 2% of inmates in the state prison system have been tested so far. Uh, do you see any need to change the regimen so that a significantly larger percentage of inmates is tested? Well, we're, you know, we're letting the, the data kind of guide us as we go through this, and, and things are evaluated uh, day by day, we've got an outstanding team of healthcare professionals and expert doctors and infectious disease professionals. 
Uh, so so they, are, they are guiding, uh, based on data, they're guiding our decisions as we move forward. So we, you know, we're going to continue to evaluate that uh, each and every day. You know, we've, we've got staff that are, are working around the clock as we fight this virus. Uh, you know, the, this is a very difficult time for our prison system. Uh, you know, working in a prison on a, on a daily basis is a very challenging uh, job. And putting COVID-19 on top of that uh, makes things even more challenging. So, you know, we've got, you know, our staff are dedicated professionals. And, you know, I've said this before, but, you know, we've got a, a, uh, a, a team of professionals that, that are part of the army of heroes in our state that are, are battling this virus. Um, and I think our staff are doing very, very well under some very, very challenging uh, conditions. You know, we've got staff in and out of the facilities uh, on a daily basis, and they have families and loved ones, um, and they're stepping up to the challenge uh, despite of, of the risks, uh, you know, to support us all as North Carolinians being safe. So thank you. Thanks so much. Next question. Is from Travis Fain with WRAL. Yeah, thank you, Travis Fain, WRAL. Uh, we're talking about surging or testing, but if you look at the seven day rolling average of number of tests given, it looks like it's actually gone down a little bit in the last week and a half or so. What is the reason for that, and how are we going to get it back up? Thanks for the question, Travis. Um, so we brought we know that testing is so important as we move forward here. Um, and we were seeing those same trends too, which is why we are really challenging ourselves and our work group um, to make sure that we are are picking that back up. And that's why earlier this week, well, it's only Wednesday today, what, Monday of this week, we sent out some new provider guidance to really um, make sure that our um, outpatient physicians and clinicians knew that they um, we have changed the way in which they can order tests. We now know that we are in a better place in terms of lab testing uh, capacity, in terms of the lab throughput, but also in terms of PPE and supplies. And so now we have given guidance to our outpatient providers that if anyone um, is suspected for COVID-19, has fever and cough, um, that, that they should use their clinical judgment and order lab tests. Um, we continue to use our state public lab, um, our, our state public health lab, excuse me, um, to prioritize uh, certain populations. Those can, we continue to prioritize healthcare workers, um, samples from some of our nursing home outbreaks, um, and other high-risk uh, populations. So we're going to continue to prioritize those in the state public health lab, um, but we continue to see an increase up. And if you look at our numbers today, we actually have seen uh, just yesterday to today even an, an increase already. Our, our testing work group uh, is particularly focused at setting up um, some additional testing sites in the community that are focused on our African-American community and other communities of color. Um, we want to make sure that we are getting a full understanding of the disease and that we are making sure all of our communities have access to testing um, all throughout North Carolina. So that's been a big focus for us this week, making sure that we're standing up those additional testing sites that feel accessible, that are trusted um, by our communities of color. So that's been a big focus. We're going to continue to push on the gas here. We're seeing what you are, Travis, and we want to see um, that, that trend go up. That's part of our, of our work over the next number of weeks. And so we're working with private and public partners to make that possible. I think this is also about distribution of resources. I think there are certain parts of the state where we have a lot of capacity, certain parts where there's less, and now making those matches so where can we help each other out. This is going to be a team effort um, across a lot of settings as we go forward, but we, we were we're seeing what you were and definitely wanted to step on the gas there and hope to see some changes over the next couple of days as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Our last question today will be from Kate Martin with Carolina Public Press. Hi, my name is Kate Martin. I'm with Carolina Public Press. Thank you for taking my question. I'm wondering if the regulation and visits to nursing homes has been halted for now as the COVID lockdowns are in place, or are federal and local regulators able to visit and conduct their important work? Kate, thanks for, for that question. So that, some of that, as you were alluding to in your question, are governed by 
federal rules. Some of that is governed at the state rules. We, we at the Department of Health and Human Services have um, authority to conduct uh, on-site surveys uh, to make sure things are safe at, at our, our nursing homes. We have a team that does that year-round, re um, responds to not only to complaints, but also make sure that folks are following um, on the, the important regulations and the safety parameters that are put in place. Uh, that though some of those uh, normal routine surveys, the one, ones that are, are done as on a routine basis, have been relaxed. That was done by the federal government. Again, we wanted our, our um, nursing home partners to be extremely focused on preventing COVID-19 from getting into the nursing home or responding if they had an outbreak of two or more cases. Um, so the federal government did ease restrictions on some of those more routine ones. Our team still does respond to uh, things that are, uh, are, are complaints and are more on the imminent uh, concern item. So there are still surveys going on, though the more routine kinds of uh, surveys are, are not being done. And that is because the federal government did loosen some of those restrictions. And again, we're in a crisis moment. We want folks to keep their eye on the ball on the crisis, but we can't forget the everyday important work that folks were doing all along. And so we have to strike the right balance uh, there um, as, as we go forward. And we'll work with our federal partners to continue to do that. With that, I think that was our last question. Thanks as always uh, for joining. Check out our website for new information and data that we put out every day. Uh, and thank you again for staying home to save lives. Have a good afternoon.